I think um, we've already waited for a few extra minutes. I think it's um, a good time to start now that I think the majority of the people is already here. So, um, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Julia Monteslanda, one of the co editors of this 35.2 volume of the ARC, uh, together with uh, Frederica Jurka and Alessandro Ciccarelli. Um, we would like to welcome you here to this uh, launch event. As a non-profit, a student-led journal, it has been extremely challenging to produce this volume during a time of global pandemic. So before anything, we would like to thank everyone that made possible that we are here tonight. And this includes uh, all of our contributors, many of them are here joining us uh, in this event, but also our peer reviews, um, the rest of the ARC committee members, uh, several people uh, in the professional staff of the archaeology department, also many academics of this, uh, of this department, um, our keynote speaker tonight, Professor Tim Ingold, and of course, every one of you that um, came here uh, to hear about uh, this Knowledge Gates uh, volume. Uh, as you can see, this is a Zoom webinar instead of a Zoom call, and this means that you will only be able to see uh, the panelists that are speaking tonight. This is because we are um, a lot of people here. Currently, 111 people are, are watching. Um, but this doesn't mean that uh, after our keynote, uh, we would like to open the floor for questions. So if you wish to make uh, questions out loud and with your camera on, please just raise your hand using the, the function at the bottom of your, of your screen and we will allow you to be seen by everyone. However, if you don't like to speak uh, with your camera on, you can also type your question on the Q&A function also at the bottom of your, of your screen. And one of us will make this uh, question out loud uh, for you. If you experience any technical issues, uh, please just use the chat uh, function so we will try to solve them. But you can also send us an email if this doesn't work to arc.knowledgecapes at gmail.com. Um, this session will be recorded and it's currently being live streamed through Facebook. So it is accessible to everyone. And also in terms of accessibility, if you think that you can benefit from automatic captions, please, um, these are available for our events, so just activate them in your Zoom accounts. Um, if, if on the contrary, these captions bother you, just deactivate them. Um, yeah, I think you just have to follow the three dots at the bottom of your screen. Um, finally, um, because these in other conditions would be an event that Will, uh, would occur in the McDonald's seminar room um, and you could purchase this volume um, after this event. Here we have to be inventive. So if you're interested in purchasing one of these volumes, uh, we will post uh, a link on the chat where uh, you can automatically uh, order uh, one of these copies. Um, I think this is enough from me uh, introducing this uh, event. Thank you very much for coming all of you. And now we would like to introduce the, the volume um, very shortly before going uh, for our keynote. And for this, I would like um, to ask Alessandro to take the lead. Thank you very much. Thanks, Julia. Yes, the uh, Archaeological Review from Cambridge is a biannual journal of archaeology, and it's run on a non-profit voluntary basis by researchers at the University of Cambridge. The ARC publications have played an important role in promoting academic discourse on methods and theories in archaeology for 40 years. Over the past decades, ARC volumes have challenged researchers to reflect on the relevance of the study of ancient knowledge and knowledge transfer. For instance, previous volumes included studies of technology and inventions in ancient societies, but also landscapes, networks, and mobility. The past volumes have contributed to investigate the reproduction and spread of technologies and ideas, especially through the study of objects, settlements, and landscapes. The present volume on knowledge scapes emerged from the desire to keep building on this tradition and to explore knowledge, its evolution, exchange, circulation, and in particular, its relevance in archaeology. For the purpose of this launch event, we would like to give an overview of the concept of knowledgescape and its relevance in archaeology. 
And for these, Frederic, uh, would you like to take over? Thank you, Alessandra, and thank you, Julia, as well. Um, I would like to give you a short introduction into what we understand by the concept of knowledge scapes. As Michael Kuypers pointed out at the launch event for the previous ARC volume, Chen Operatoire, knowledge and the history of knowledge have recently received a lot of interest, particularly in history and anthropology. Then our volume, simply entitled Knowledge Scapes, was in its last editing stages. In it, we and our contributors argue that engaging with the myriad aspects and variations of knowledge, the different scales of community in which it develops and the dynamics of its exchange is a fruitful endeavor also for archeology. span It allows us to acknowledge the specificities of societies in different time periods and regions, and at the same time to crystallize mechanisms of social relationships behind the evolution and change of knowledge. It induces us to focus on the dynamics within and between societies and their environment, providing detail to our understanding of social coherence in the past. Knowledge includes information, but also experience, skills, technological knowledge, concepts, beliefs, and ritual knowledge. Knowledge can be explicit, but also implicit or tacit, everyday and concrete, abstract and conceptual, local or universal, agreed upon or disputed. Even within a given society, different variations of knowledge can coexist, complement, compete and conflict. Knowledge emerges from and is reproduced through practice. Active interaction is the key to the exchange of knowledge between individuals, generations and societies. In archaeology, Knowledge has been investigated through cognition, cultural transmission, technology and belief, practice and agency and skill. As archaeologists, we find ourselves at the intersection between propositional knowledge, knowing that, and practical knowledge, that is knowing how, emphasizing that knowledge is something that is performed, done or made rather than possessed. In this conceptual shift, Knowledge turns from being from existing purely in people's minds to being in the world around them, and that's visible to archaeologists. This diversity echoes a Padraig's notion of the fluid and irregular shape of his global cultural flows. Now, by no means do we want to add a sixth flow to this to his reflections on globalization, but the suffix scape here encompasses the contexts and environments in which knowledge evolves, changes, is transmitted and exchanged and dissolves. Landscapes, qualitative and perspectival, reflect the variety of relations by which knowledge emerges and circulates. Just as with landscapes, we cannot ask how much of a knowledge scape there is, but only what it is like. Knowledge scapes therefore reveal the situated, socially constructed and physical spaces which connect individuals and materials through shared ideas and practices over time. The term knowledge scape itself was first used in the context of cognitive theory, anthropological thought and knowledge management, where it draws on and is applied to modern social, political and economic questions. Its proponents were concerned with the mechanisms of knowledge transformation, emphasizing the diversity and contextual dependency of knowledge and its role in modern socio-spatial considerations. In the social sciences, it is applied to rethink spatial research. In anthropology, Knowledge scape was used to advocate for the recognition of knowledge production in what may be termed peripheral regions of the Western academic tradition, providing an interactive playing field for academic discourse. From the start, the concept was deeply intertwined with archaeology's concern with the material. The cognitive theory of external symbolic storage sparked an influential debate in the 1990s about the role of material culture in cognition at this very department. It served as the conceptual basis for the first cognitive theory of knowledge scapes. Evolutionary archaeologists concerned with cultural transmission theory explored the long lasting connections between individuals, materials and environments through which knowledge scapes are maintained. The first proposed use of knowledge scape in archaeology emerged in 2015, when at a workshop for young researchers at the Excellence Cluster Topoi in Berlin, Wissensräume, or spaces of knowledge, made their way into the German archaeological discourse. The papers in our volume explore knowledge scapes through a variety of theoretical and methodological approaches with a long history in archaeology. 
These include theories of social landscape, materiality and social learning, as well as chien operatoire, communities of practice and task habitus, emphasizing the performed material practice of knowledge. Socially constructed landscapes, concerned with the relationships between individuals and materials in the physical environment, are understood as forged through actions and sustained by persistent individual activities. They represent networks of meaning, of relationships, at multiple dimensions of space. Communities of practice emphasize the time and sustained interaction between practitioners required to gain a certain shared set of practical skills and knowledge. Their landscapes of knowledge are actively constructed and perceived by people sharing an interest, deepening their knowledge through continuous interaction. Through the repetition of tasks in a specific social environment, practitioners develop a way of doing and of being. Skilled individuals develop a task habitus, able to quickly adjust their actions without affecting the overall outcome. Here, individuals are the focus and medium through which knowledge scapes are expressed and reproduced. The chaine operatoire then moves the focus to the material component of this relationship. The knowledge scape that becomes expressed and expressive in each step of the technological process may be examined, its transmission, survival or loss theorized. The choices made throughout the Shen encapsulate socially and culturally transformed actions, informed actions, and a shared understanding of practice. But they are also affected by physical constraints and material properties, adding another dimension to our study of knowledge scapes. A key advantage of a theory of knowledge scapes is its expressed flexibility with regard to scale, as the contributions highlight. This problem is by no means new to archaeology. The fluid and irregular character of knowledge scapes allows us to tease apart and bridge the variety of material evidence, people and dynamics across time, space and social scale, thereby diversifying our understanding of the manifestations of shared knowledge. It affords us the opportunity to characterize phenomena of identity and boundary, sociability and homophily, as well as those of social segregation and rejection. Knowledge scapes, we believe, present a versatile lens which reflects and encompasses both knowledge in the past and knowledge of the past and studies their variety, inception, change, circulation and loss within their social and physical context. And with this, I would like to hand over to Julia who will introduce you to how these aspects were addressed by our contributors. Thank you very much, Joy. Let me just, there we are. Um, if Rebecca just presented how we, the editors, uh, understood and used this concept, I would like now to briefly present the different contributions within this volume. This ARC volume compiles eight original papers written by nine different auto authors from several international um, institutions. These papers exemplify the potential of the use of knowledge escapes in archaeological practice and cover a wide chronological and spatial scope. Case studies go from Calcolithic to medieval times and from East Africa to Britain, including in other places that cover in Cyprus, Italy, or Iberia. Our first paper, written by Ems Clark from University of Cambridge and Gonzalo Linares Matas from Oxford University, is entitled The Role of Landscape Knowledge Networks in the Early Place to See in Technological Variability of East Africa. In this paper, the authors link the accumulation of knowledge about the environment through the creation of knowledge networks to the evolution of early Pleistocene Old Duvan and Aculian lithic assemblages. They argued that these networks would have increased predictability for accessing high rank food resources. Our second paper was written by Witt Spicer from Ebert Harkals Universitat Tübingen, and it is titled Knowledge Escapes as Resources, an Archaeological Approach to the Construction of Cultural and Social Identities. Witt discusses the Heron of Poseidonium Paestrum as a case study of knowledge escapes related to the construction of past sacred spaces, cultural memories, and identities. Our third paper was written by Rafael Lautari from University of Cambridge, and it is entitled Cheesecakes, an, an ethno-archaeological approach to the construction of cultural and social identities. 
This paper shows how social, economic, and cosmological aspects are interlinked in the configuration of the Halloumi making knowledge case. The insights offered by Rafael invites us to reconsider these otherwise inaccessible aspects of Darwin in our archaeological studies. Our fourth uh, paper um, keeps us in Cyprus and is written by Maria Hachi Gabriel, based at uh, Leiden University. And it is uh, called A Tale of Red and Black, Reconstructing Transfer of Knowledge in Late Calcolithic Cyprus. This paper aims to investigate what interactions between communities of producers can tell us about sharing of technological knowledge in Western Cyprus and about knowledge scapes connecting communities of practice and settlements. Our fifth paper is written by Salem Prado, based at McMaster University, and its title is Esoteric Botanical Knowledge Scapes of Medieval Iberia. Prado explores the knowledge of plants in med med medieval Iberia as encoded in the Picatrix text, the Latin translation of the Arabic Gayat al-Hakim. Such esoteric botanical knowledge caves offers new insights into the ritual, symbolic, and quasi-medical uses of plants in the past in order to interpret paleobotanical data. Our sixth paper is um, written by Elena Scarcella, uh, based at the University of Cambridge. I stick them with the pointy end, the knowledge scape of sword fighting in archaic central Italy. This paper is focused on the distribution of different types of lone swords in central Italy and their relation to the spread of their associated fighting styles. Interestingly, these fighting knowledge scapes, built through consistent practice, coexist within the broader warrior identity of archaic times. Our seventh paper was written by Tiffany Treadway who is based at Cardiff University. His title is Traditions of the Separate Creation of Wetland Deposition Knowledge Capes. This paper reconsiders our interpretations of wetland deposition practices in Iron Age Britain. On the basis of archival records from Wales and Scotland, Treadway demonstrates how the recognition and redefinition of specific types of depositions allows us to reconsider the presence of knowledge scapes related to these practices. Last but not least, we have the paper written by Juan La Torre Ruiz, also based in Oxford University, and is titled Knowledge Scapes as an Alternative to Long-Term Geodeterminism in Traveling and Movement. This paper explores the role of knowledge and geography in seafaring in the Bay of Biscay from the Bronze Age to late, to late antiquity. La Torre Ruiz redefines persistent sea routes as passed on by generations of travelers through knowledge caves, in which the practical and theoretical knowledge necessary to move between two points is passed down from experienced travelers to novices. These are the main original papers we have in our volume, but uh, the last part of this volume is dedicated to four different book reviews edited by James Clark. And the main contributions come from Rhonda McGovern, Victoria Sainsbury, Carmen Martin Ramos, and Kim Eileen Roof. Um, also, I would like to briefly mention our cover artist, Matilde Ritzi. Um, I hope this uh, short introduction, introduction made you want to read this volume. Uh, but uh, it's probably time already to introduce our keynote speaker tonight. And for that, I would like to pass the word to Frederick again. Thank you. Our guest tonight needs no introduction. Our thinking about the concept has been influenced in no small part by his work. So we are very grateful that he accepted our invitation to speak tonight. Professor Timothy Ingold is Emeritus Professor of Social Anthropology at the University of Aberdeen. He is the author of several influential books and has just finished a new collection of 23 essays called Imagining for Real, which will be published in November this year. Along with his previous essay collections, The Perception of the Environment, published in 2000, and Being Alive, published in 2011, it is intended to form the third volume of a, new, of a trilogy and wrap up three decades of work. Additionally, and perhaps less well known, he contributed to the Archaeological Review from Cambridge in 1990. His paper, Society, Nature and the Concept of Technology, was published in volume 9.1, Technology in the Humanities, and found its way 
revised uh, into the perception of the environment. We are very glad to have him with us tonight. And without further ado, Professor Tim Ingold. Well, thank you very much. It's a, it's a great honor to, to join you all. And maybe I should begin by, by congratulating you on producing such a fine special issue. Um, it's, um, it's very fine to see it. And I, I, when I saw the cover picture, I, I was almost, it's a beautiful picture, and it almost persuaded me that perhaps this idea of knowledge scapes is really a good one. Uh, it certainly makes it extremely attractive. Because I have to confess that when I first saw the word knowledge scapes, I thought, no, not another scape. Uh, and, and then I realized that I contributed to this fashion myself many years ago by coining the term taskscape. It's a, a term that I brought in in, in 1993, but I never liked it. And, um, and subsequently, the, the geog it was actually the geographer um, Ken Olwig, who tried to persuade me that that really in the concept of landscape, which is of medi early medieval origin from Northwest Europe, the land part and the scape part are really so intimately connected that neither really makes sense without the other. And I, I also got the feeling that, that this tendency to uh, add scape to just about anything uh, under the sun uh, you know, you can you can just invent a word and put scape at the end of it. Um, television scape, breakfast scape, um, coffee scape. Um, that 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 after a while, there's there's a risk that um, that that whatever significance the term might have had could get lost. So uh, I started off reading this collection of papers, which I read very quickly. I'm afraid over over the weekend. Um, and, and what I'm presenting here is a somewhat like a, an instant reaction to it. I started off, I have to say, with a, with a degree of skepticism. I was thinking, no, we don't need another scape. So then I thought, what would, be, what would persuade me to take on this concept? So I asked myself in, in thinking about the papers and re reacting to them, I asked myself, what would... If I were to adopt this concept in my own work, if I were to take it on board and think, yes, I need this what this concept of knowledge scape, what would it actually allow me to do or allow me to think or to say, which other concepts that we already have don't allow me to do? What is the added value, so to speak, of this concept? What does it give us that other concepts don't? And I did come up with a, with a few answers to them, to this question four actually which i'll i'll speak briefly about um the the problem is that that many of the things that i think this concept could potentially give us also stand in some rather critical relation to the way in which it's used um in the contributions so i'm in in, in this slightly awkward position of of wanting to to support these endeavors and to criticize them at the same time but so i hope um if I make any criticisms, that they'll be taken in the spirit in which they're intended, uh, as, as constructive rather than in any sense um, dismissive. Because um, as an anthropologist, looking at archaeological work from the outside, uh, I'm always impressed and amazed by, um, by, by the, the work you're able to do and how much you're able to find out from what seems on the surface to be such fragmentary material. So here are four things. Oh, I'll go through them each, uh, one in turn. The first thing I thought that the concept of knowledge scape would allow one to do is to think of knowledge as a field of continuous differentiation rather than divided up into distinct internally homogeneous territories. And of course, that's the way in which we used in the old days and um, to think about cultures. Uh, we imagined the cultural world as a mosaic. Um, and so, so it was, you, you could think of it as, as so many pieces, each adjacent to every other piece, so that um, you know, everybody in culture A would think one way or know these, these things, and everybody in culture B would know those things. And all so that 
within each culture, uh, knowledge would be entirely homogeneous, it would be collectively shared, and all the difference would be pushed onto the boundaries between them. And indeed, there are still anthropologists who think like that, who, who think of difference effectively as division, and suppose that cultures are homogeneous and difference is like and, and difference lies on the on the borders between. And the beauty of the well, the beauty of the landscape concept is that it enables us to think of a terrain as something that is essentially continuous, could go on forever, and yet it always looks different depending on where you stand in it. And you can go from one place to another, uh, you can walk through a landscape and go from one place to another, and you know you're in the first place because that's the way the lo world looks from there, and you know you're in your other another place because that's the world, way the world looks from there, and you can go from one place to the other without ever crossing any boundary. It's something simply that as you go, the vista is continually changing because what you see depends on where you stand. And, and this seemed to me to be really quite attractive if one could um, apply the same argument to knowledge and say the thing about knowledge is precisely that it is not divided up into fixed bounded territories, nor is it uh, nor, nor does anybody know exactly the same thing, although there's a great deal of overlap between what one person knows and another person knows, because what they know depends on precisely where they stand within this continuous variation. So that, to start off with, the idea that, that what you know depends on where you are, depends on your positionality within a field of relationships with human others, with non-human others, with the land, it doesn't matter with just whatever kind of relationships there are, but, but, but what you know depends on where you stand within such a field of relationships, rather than um, on whether you belong or, or been socialized into this particular body of people or that particular body of people, seems to me to be a very productive way to think. Um, so that was the first uh, the first point about what knowledge scape could do that the more traditional concepts for talking about knowledge, such as culture, um, don't do so well. <clears throat> but then you come to the second thing, and which, which to some extent follows from this, <clears throat> and that is that I think the idea of knowledge scape helps us to get away from the idea that knowledge can be packaged into bodies of heritable content. That is in the old, rather conventional notion of a tradition. Um, never mind what traditions really mean to people, but in, 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 in sort of the classical literature, uh, a tradition was understood pretty much as a, as, as a body of knowledge. Uh, fairly well integrated, which is then passed on by whatever mechanism of learning or socialization or enculturation from one generation to the next. And, and actually, it seems to me that the idea of knowledge state scape helps to take us away from that idea. And, and here I want to make a little detour because um, although um, I have used the concepts of tacit knowledge and embodied knowledge in the past, even I think, because I had a quick look back in that 1990 paper to which you refer, where I happily talk about tacit knowledge and embodied knowledge because everybody else refers to it latterly, and actually in a chapter of the new book that you mentioned and that's in the press at the moment, I've decided I really don't like these concepts. I, I think there's something fundamentally wrong with the idea of tacit knowledge and, uh, and also something fundamentally wrong with the idea of embodied knowledge. And there's something even more wrong with linking the two and assuming that tacit and embodied mean the same thing. Um, just to go back into history, the idea of tacit knowledge was coined by, um, by Michael Polanyi, the, the philosopher. Um, and 
he referred to that kind of what he called also personal knowledge, knowledge that ad adheres so closely to the person of the practitioner that is so built into the way they operate that it's almost impossible to spell it out in any kind of explicit terms. And that, that was his, um, his thesis. Uh, but he was very clear that what he was referring to was a domain of the mind. He said we had to think of the mind as explicit knowledge in the mind and there is tacit knowledge in the mind. He wasn't talking about the body at all. Uh, and, and it was later social theory, worst of all, Pierre Bourdieu, who got us all into custom to thinking about, oh, no, that means um, basically the, the knowledge of the habitus that is, that is incorporated into the body through what he called a, a hidden pedagogy. Now, what, what tacit means literally is silent. And the idea, I think, when, when, when Polanyi meant that, well, the craftsman, for example, can't explain what he's doing, uh, he, or he can't, at least he can't explain how he does it. And so he's silent, he's, he's, he's dumb, he's, he's quiet. Um, and, and the idea is somehow that this knowledge has sunk into him or her so deeply, it's so deep down, deep down here, that, that, that it can't come out. Uh, and the only things that can be expressed are, are explicit verbal formulae. Now, one thing that's wrong with this is that um, every craftsperson we know can speak at enormous length about what they do and have no problem. And this idea of the silent craftsman is an academic myth that has been put about by academics who like to think that the only proper kind of speech, the only proper kind of language is fully propositional. And the fact that craftspeople speak of what they do in a practical way, in an ostensive way, in a story-based and narrative way, then disqualifies it so far as academics are concerned. But the fact is that craftspeople can talk at length and with great passion about what they do. And the second thing is um, as that I think, as, as you said in your interaction, in, uh, as, as Julia, I think, said in her interaction, interaction or, or somebody did, that the thing about this knowledge is that it is performed. It's knowledge that actually is, is not that it exists somewhere in some quiet place in the head and then applied. It's knowledge that actually exists in the performance. And performances are full of movement. They're lively. There's stuff going on and they make a lot of noise. So the idea that performed knowledge can be tacit, quiet, subdued, silent, sunk like the bottom of an iceberg into the stomach doesn't make any kind of sense. What? Because this knowledge is actually going on in a field of contact, of relationships, very tactile field, of relationships between an acting body and all the stuff in the environment. So I think we should understand this knowledge as being animate, lively, mobile. If you want a comparison, it's not the base of the iceberg. You know, in so many discussions of tacit and explicit knowledge, we say the explicit knowledge is the tip of the iceberg and the tacit knowledge is its subterranean base. If we want an analogy, it's not the base of the iceberg, but imagine an archipelago of islands and all the water swirling around in between. It's the water that's swirling around in between. That is the knowledge that we're after. And I think that could be the knowledge of the knowledge scape, meaning that it's very fluid, it's very lively, and it's going on, not, it's not inside a body, but going on in the relations among bodies. It's in the it's in the medium. It's lively. It's performative, and that means too that it's not strictly speaking embodied. Uh, it's it's obvious a truism to say that it is bodily knowledge. That it's it's knowledge that um, that is part of a way a body works in an environment. But bodily and embodied don't mean the same thing. Embodied means somehow taken in and absorbed, wrapped up into the body. And that's just what this knowledge isn't. So it isn't embodied, it's not tacit. It is very lively, very fluid, it is animate, and it goes on in the milieu 
in between uh, all the different bodies that are involved in knowing in an environment. Now, this gets me to the, the crux of the matter, and that is that if, if, if we think of knowledge in that kind of way, not as a package of information that is passed from head to head, but it's something that is going on in the field of relations between them, then I don't think it makes sense to use the metaphor of transmission. That's another thing that I've really come out against recently, that I think um, you can say in a reasonable sort of way that, of course, uh, uh, your people are doing sort of the same things from one generation to the next. And, and as, as was shown very convincingly in some of the papers, in the, in the paper on, on learning on pottery making, on cheese making, it's perfectly clear that there are ways of doing things that are passed on from one generation to the next. But I think it's very dangerous or slippery to refer to this passing on as transmission, because as soon as you word, use a word like transmission, it suggests a sort of mechanical metaphor or a telecommunications metaphor in which there is a, a, a body of content, information, that is sort of passed along the wire from a sender to a recipient. And that, I think, is just um, what is not happening. We'll get onto that in a moment in the next point, which is focusing more on, on, on learning. Um, but it, it seems to me that, that um, that we should understand, oh no, we can talk about learning now, that, 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 that um, when you learn a craft like pottery or how to make cheese, or indeed how to wield a sword in, in combat, or in, just take some of the examples in, in your volume, it is um, what I've called an, an education of attention. It's, it's, it's learning how to notice the things that matter and respond in your movement to those things that you notice. So that you do things at exactly the right moment, at the right time, so that your, your, your activity is precisely attuned to the materials you're dealing with. So if you're cooking cheese, you, know, you have to take something off the boil at exactly the right moment. If you're uh, trying to kill somebody with a sword, you know, I have to get, get them at the right point, stick them at the right point. Or the, and if you're making a, a pot, you, you have to, again, um, do, get, get, get things right. And that means the skilled practitioner who knows how to do things notices those crucial moments, the point at which you must do this or that. Uh, so that uh, it's not as though there's a, a package of information that is passed down, which is then applied in practice. In fact, you're learning on the job through working together with an already skilled practitioner and developing those skills of perception yourself. So we're, we're basically talking about a developmental process, an ontogenetic process. And if it turns out that people in one generation are as proficient as the people in the generation preceding, this it doesn't mean that information in the first generation has been transmitted to the next. It means rather that you have an outcome of convergent development, that, that um, given the right conditions, people will grow up um, being able to do uh, the same sorts of things, not necessarily exactly the same, but the same sorts of things that their predecessors did. I mean, every child, or almost every child, barring disability, learns eventually to walk. Uh, and it's not as though there's a kind of a walking module that's transmitted from parent to child. The, the learning to walk is part of a process of development that goes on in an environment with walking caregivers and sorts of things that you can support yourself on if you're a baby. So, so the fact that you know, each generation learns to walk, it doesn't mean that walking is transmitted from one generation to the next. It means that there's a process of convergent development that is reproduced over and over again. And, and critically, uh, this is absolutely not a process of automation. Um, I, 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 one of the, one of the, mm, errors that comes in when we start thinking of uh, learning as a process of, of um, 
of embodiment of tacit information is the idea that somehow uh, what you learn becomes incorporated as an automatic habit. Well, maybe that's the case in learning to drive, uh, to change gears on a car or something like that, or even brush your teeth. But, but for most kinds of, of craft, um, learning involves uh, a heightened degree of attention. Uh, we call it concentration. It's the very opposite of, of automatic processes. So, um, so, so, so um, we have to think differently about habit, um, not, not, not as thinking of habit as some sort of addiction or some kind of rut that you've got into, but it's something that is actually quite creative uh, and even virtuous. I mean, how often do you hear people talking about their good habits? We somehow got into this idea that habits are always bad. They're the kind of sedimented stuff that's got sunk into you and you can't do anything about. But we could think about habit as a way in which we actually dwell in the tasks that we do. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about these matters recently in, in evolutionary biology. If, if you've been following um, all the debate about so-called niche construction and ecological inheritance, where a number of evolutionary biologists now are saying that, that, um, that organisms construct their environments in their lives and that those environments are themselves passed on to the next generation so that what every generation receives is not just a body of transmitted knowledge, but also an environment that has been, um, that has been shaped by the activity of previous generations. I, I myself think that there's something wrong with these models uh, because, again, of the way in which they're talking about inheritance or transmission. It doesn't seem to me to make sense to say that, um, that enduring features of an environment that have been around forever, since time immemorial, have been inherited from one generation to the next seems to me to make more sense to say that they're simply there. So if we take, for example, the, the, the question of navigation in one of the papers which that we, uh, dealt with this question, um, and most, most uh, pre-modern navigators were using the star, uh, uh, ocean, pre-modern navigators at sea were using the stars. And in historical times, with a few exceptions, the stars remain pretty much in the same place. They're always, they've always been there. It doesn't, to my, to my mind, make any sense to say that one generation inherits the stars from the next. And that's like saying that we just kind of package up the stars and send them down. But the stars are there. They're the environment that, that this generation is in and then the next generation is in, so that it's a perduring environment, not an inherited one. And so we maybe have to think the same about knowledge scapes. If, if the knowledge is actually in there, in the stars, then it's not being transmitted. Uh, it's, it, it's part of a perduring environment that is then um, that, that one generation after the next encounters under the guidance of its predecessors. So third point as to why I think why what, what the, the the third point in which there might be something in the idea of knowledge scapes for me is that it helps actually to shift the emphasis from knowledge to ways of knowing. And this is very important. It's, it's been talked about quite a lot in anthropology where people have been very unhappy about the, about the, the, the hypostasization of knowledge, treating knowledge as a thing. Uh, when really it's a process. Uh, it's, a, it's a way of knowing, a particular path to follow. But, but I think with, an, with, with the idea of knowledge scape, we could say, okay, you're in the knowledge scape, so what do you do? You go for a trip, you go for a journey, you'll take a path through this knowledge scape, and you could go this way, or you could go that way. So the knowledge scape affords a number of diff just as the landscape affords a number of different paths that you can follow, and each one will give you a different experience. So perhaps the knowledge scape allows one to think of knowing as a way of following a path in a particular way. And I, I like that um, very much because it allows us to see that knowledge is not something that is cumulative, cumulatively built up 
or accumulated, but something that proceeds along ways of life and and is told then in a narrative form as the stories of these ways. After all, most people, if you ask them about their knowledge, they'll 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 say what they know by telling it as a story. And that story is the story of their own passage through the knowledge scape, the trip they took, and what they came to know as a result of taking it. So we can think of of, of a path through the knowledge scape as a way of knowing, and then the whole texture of the knowledge scape as woven out of all these myriad paths. And I thought the paper on cheesescapes, um, I, I, and so we, we, we always at lunchtime have a little cheese board with some cheese out. So I, I, I said to my wife as we had lunch, well, here's our cheesecape uh, on, on, on the table. Uh, so I, I, I like that idea very much. But, but also that, that paper um, gives a very good example of what that could mean. I mean, it does actually describe the particular pathways um, you take through this cheese making landscape. And, and, and each path is indeed a story, a narrative of what you do, as told by um, very skilled practitioners. So instead of having to talk about a plurality of knowledges, which I always find difficult, as soon as you turn knowledge into this thing, and then think you can have lots of them, I think that's that's problematic. We can we can talk about a plurality of ways of knowing. And linked to that, um, I suppose is the problem I've always had with um, cognitive approaches. And I, I noticed how, when you explained the, the origin of this term and how it was first introduced, it, it was part of an explicitly cognitive, cognitive theory. Um, the people who were proposing it were proposing it as part of an overall cognitive model of how one um, knows the landscape. And in that sense, cognition is something that is imposed upon the data of sense from the material world. I mean, if you're a cognitivist, you say that there are all this sensory data that is bombarding the body, and then along come your cognitive models and you impose some form on it. Or if you're making an artifact, again, you have a, a, a model of what it should be like in your head, and you impose the form on the material. The trouble with that, then, is, is that the effect of that sort of reasoning is that it siphons off all the form from the material, uh, the, the materials of the world, puts it in the mind, with the result that the material world itself is left formless. So we end up, by the, 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 the result of, of creating the knowledge scape is to turn the landscape into nothing but a substrate of brute matter with no form at all, waiting for the forms of the knowledge scape to be imposed upon it. This seems to be to be wrong. Uh, I think it would be much more productive actually to see how we can bring these levels of knowing and of being in the land together. Uh, and that leads me to the fourth point I wanted to make about what knowledge scape could do for me anyway, is that it helps us to see how the landscape itself can be a source of knowledge to those who inhabit it and attend to it. In other words, what I, I'm suggesting that at the end of the day, knowledge scape and landscape are precisely the same thing. And what the concept of knowledge scape enables us to do is to realize that a landscape, an inhabited landscape, a landscape that people dwell in and do things in and carry out their crafts in, is itself um, something, a place, a region from which they can gather knowledge and meaning through attending to the world as they go about it and doing the things they do. So the strategy here is actually the same strategy that I employed when I when I um, coined this notion of taskscape. Um, it was part of an argument about how about the temporality of the landscape, and my argument was that um, that we have to understand the landscape as something that is cast in process in temporal processes, 
and and I introduced the idea of the task and the taskscape in order to draw attention to the temporality of these processes. But once I'd done that, I could say, well, actually, I brought in this notion of taskscape in order to get rid of it. Because once we've temporalized the landscape, we don't need taskscape anymore. It, it, it was just a scaffold that enabled us to realize that the landscape is not purely spatial and non-temporal. And that once we can show that it is temporal by talking about the array of tasks, we can see that actually we've been talking about the landscape all along. And I had the same feeling about the knowledge scape. That once you're able to show that the land that people inhabit is itself for them an inexhaustible source of knowledge and wisdom, which they get by attending to it and observing it and following it. Once we've understood that, that the landscape is not just neutral, but that it, it, it gives to those who inhabit it then we don't need the concept anymore. What we have instead is a, is a much enriched notion of, um, of what the landscape could be. So those are the things that knowledgescape gives to me. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll stop very much. Well, Tim, thank you so much for your uh, presentation. That was extraordinary. That was brilliant. Um, well, I, we would like to open the floor to uh, questions and possibly a discussion. Uh, as mentioned by uh, Julia at the beginning of the uh, talk, uh, you can use the Q&A function that you will find on the toolbar below the screen or you can also just use your raise hand function in the chat box and we will um, give you the chance to ask your question live. Uh, we do have already a couple of questions for you, if you don't mind, Tim. Um, perhaps, um, well, we do have one as editors to, to begin with. Um, uh, yeah, please, uh, Frederic, if you don't mind. Sure, thank, thank you so much for these reflections. Um, as I said, um, a lot of our um, thoughts about the concept have been very influenced by um, what you had written before. And um, I was particularly intrigued by your idea of um, the way that we think about uh, learning and how that becomes an education in, at in attention, essentially. Um, and I also thought that it might give us the opportunity to um, not only think about the way that information or that learning happens um, between generations, say from the older generation to the younger generation, but actually also across generations, um, sorry, um, within generations. Within, within. Mm. Yeah. Or from the younger generation to the older generation. So, yeah, so sorry, sorry. I was, uh, so, so, yeah, was there a question there or was that just a? I think that was more of a comment, but I was thinking okay. if you could perhaps elaborate a little bit on that idea um, of of learning as a as, as an education of attention within yes. and within or across generations. Yes, I'd be happy to. I, I the thing is that that I think we I, I think that we need to to think differently about generations, and um, there, there, there's a a, a tendency uh, in our tradition of thought, I suppose, to think of every generation as a layer, as a an, an often horizontal layer, so that in many diagrams, you know, the, the cross-generation links or intergenerational links will be vertical and the generation will be horizontal. Uh, so, you know, in, in, in evolutionary biology, for example, inheritance is always vertical and development is always horizontal. Um, and, and the inheritance goes on down the generations, development happens successively in each generation. So we, we think of, of each generation as a layer following the next. And, and that means that in our theories of, about learning and development, we, we tend to make a complete break between mechanisms of, in, of inheritance 
and mechanisms of development. So the two are completely separate. That's fairly basic, for example, to Darwinian theory. What if we thought of life not as a succession of layers, but as something like a rope? And a rope is twisted from fibers. Every fiber is only so long, but the rope can go on forever because as you twist a rope, you're always introducing new fibers as old ones um, give out. And, and, and imagine then that the people of each generation or a person of each generation is, is, is one of those fibers of the rope and it's twisting with all the other fibers so that lives are overlapping and the continuity of life is, is continually produced through this overlap. So we have generations not following one another like layers, but lives overlapping with, with one another. So on, on, on the farm, um, the grandparent, sorry, the grandparents, parents and children uh, are all wo working together. So those three generations are overlapping and passing it on and passing it on. Then instead of imagining learning, which passes stuff from generation to generation as a transmission uh, equivalent to inheritance from one layer to the next. It's actually the productive process itself. It's actually those generations doing things together, uh, hearing each other, listening to stories, um, all, all these things that, that the old and the young in most societies up until modernity would do together. That's how life is is handed on um, and and I, I I found that thinking of of generational succession in terms of the twisting of a rope rather than successive layers completely and fundamentally alters one's uh, one's view of things uh, of learning in particular Thank you so much for for your answer and for elaborating, elaborating further on this. And we do have um, one person with a raised hand, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Talaga. Um, apologies for the mispronunciation. Um, I'm gonna, you should be able to... But this has a long question on the Q&A that I found. So it, is, is yeah. that it? I think, I think it should be able to speak now if they unmute themselves. Uh, Talaga, you should be able to unmute yourself now if you want to ask your question live. Uh, yes, I did. Uh, can you hear me? I can, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, great. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity and I'm really honored to be able to be here and uh, and uh, listen to, 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 all, to the, these two speeches. And uh, I have a question. Uh, in fact, I have many questions, but I'll confine myself to one. Uh, and it, uh, it is related to uh, uh, your uh, sort of critique of the concepts of uh, tacit knowledge, the tacit knowledge and embodied knowledge. And you, um, your critique hinged on this silence and also this uh, embodiment that uh, the, the, the concepts names imply. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought about the situation because um, even even if we uh, if we agree that uh, craftspeople uh, um, can narrate about their uh, their skill and practice for hours on end, that this uh, does not automatically mean that they can um, let's say convey uh, their knowledge, narration, and let's say knowledge not transmission. Right? <laughs> you don't like the word, but. Uh, I couldn't come up with anything better uh, at the moment. So uh, narration and knowledge transmission are not the same things to my mind. And uh, I, I can easily imagine a situation in which a person uh, has been trained in a skill, but they lack the linguistic resources, so to say, to pass on this knowledge. And mm -hmm. uh, in a way, this knowledge is uh, uh, enclosed, captured, within the body of, of such a craftsperson. And uh, while, mm, while the person cannot uh, verbally transmit the knowledge or teach anybody, 
uh, they can still teach it uh, with other means by they by their bodily presence mm. and uh, by this i mean not only imitation but uh, also uh, such uh, such learning could happen through the sense of touch or through giving feedback by eye contact while observing uh, an apprentice uh, in practice for example so in a way this knowledge would in fact be tacit or silent because it wouldn't there would be no way to verbally express it and it, it would be also embodied so uh, such examples and I know one such example from my own experience um, would uh, would suggest that it's indeed justified to talk about tacit and embodied knowledges and that these two things can sometimes overlap. Uh, but yeah, but that's to my mind. So I would love to hear a comment on that. Thank you. Okay, thanks for the question. This is, this is a big, <laughs> a big and complicated issue. I mean, I'm trying to think of examples myself um, uh, where um, if, if there are people who really are unable to talk about what they do, there have been some remarkable studies of um, of old folk who are supposed to be suffering from dementia, although that's rather um, a, a stigma that is put upon them by the medical establishment. But but for example, there, there's a wonderful research with with um, people who were uh, who 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 were, were once fishermen. Uh, and would know how to weave their nets or basket makers um, who do find, because they're very elderly, um, that it's quite difficult to string words together in a, in a sensible way, but put the materials in their hands that they're used to working with and off they go. They have no problem at all. Put a young person next to them uh, who wants to learn the skill and again, there's no problem at all. The young person watches, imitates, copies, watches what the other person is doing, is corrected as necessary, and they can do all that without necessarily um, exchanging any any words at all. They can do it by, uh, by by pointing, by eye contact, and all sorts of things. So that so that it is technically possible to do that. Um, however. Uh, most of the time, um, uh, words are mixed up with all sorts of other things in any kind of learning situation. Um, there, there, there are obviously all sorts of gestures, pointing, picking up tools, doing this, that, and the other, and in between all that, various words might, might be spoken. And there's no particular reason why we should make a great separation between what is words and what isn't. Uh, they're all, all is being performed, it's all part doing that is going on. I mean, you have to remember that words themselves um, are, are, um, are very well up. Um, when we speak them, it's part of our way of being as much as, as gesture is, as using a tool is, as working with materials is, speaking is too. Uh, and so it strikes me uh, that that if anything is tacit, really quiet, it's the explicit, because explication means pinning things down to fixed coordinates. And most often in people who talk about explicit versus tacit knowledge, they actually mean by explicit knowledge, knowledge in writing. And of course, a written page is completely quiet, unless you happen to be a medieval monk uh, in, in which case you're reading the page by moving your finger over the words and mumbling the sound as it as as it as, as you do and hearing the sounds you make in your mumbling because that's the way they used to read in those days. But but uh, but if you were to take um, a, a, if if you were to take um, a page of of instructions for your flat pack furniture from B and Q or from um, wherever you get it from. Uh, and uh, then that is absolutely silent. So uh, very explicit, uh, or supposed to be, because it gives a kind of exploded diagram of everything. It tells you what to do, 
no sound at all, and no movement either. So that's 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 what I'm getting what I'm getting at. Okay, yeah, that's that's thought provoking. Thank you very much. Many, many thanks for the questions and also for the for your answer, Tim. And I have uh, Cornelia. Um, I'm gonna invite you um, to actually ask your question live. You can unmute yourself now if you want. Yeah, hello, good evening. Uh, thank you for your very, uh, very um, inspiring uh, comments and, uh, and the presentation of your, um, also your, your um, uh, more critical thoughts uh, on, on this on this concept, and I'd like to uh, take the opportunity to greet Maciek Talaga because we are from the same uh, PhD program, so uh, it's a kind of a bit of co coincidence. Um, I'm interested mostly in um, like the contact zones between different identities, social identities, and how uh, they um, sometimes merge together um, when uh, when they are in, in some kind of contact zones uh, together. And I think knowledge, of course, is also a, a form of a social um, um, part of social identity because it, it, it is very, very close to, to those people performing it. And um, I'm, I'm also thinking about applying this con concept of knowledge scapes to, to, to my studies and I'm I'm trying to um, uh, to to um, put it all together in my head. When when we think about uh, knowledge scapes, we also have to think about its borders. Uh, even if they are fluent, even if they are uh, kind of not really visible, sometimes uh, they uh, overlap with other uh, knowledge scapes. Uh, but however, there are sometimes uh, uh, groups of people and uh, 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 or let's talk about those knowledge scapes when they when they clash together uh, and they are not always um, compatible with each other and i'm i'm trying to think about your um presentation of knowledge as not just like a cluster of mosaics that can be like pick and choose you can pick and choose your knowledge uh, to a certain uh, to a certain degree but is a sort of a pathway and my question is like, what is your stance on, on this? Uh, um, well, more or less like a mind experiment of um, different knowledge scapes uh, clashing together and uh, and being um, mm, yeah, being confronted more or less. Mm. That, that's an interesting question because I, I, if we go back to, to landscape and from which the analogy came, I've, I've always felt very uncomfortable about pluralizing the concept of landscape. Um, you know, you, people do sometimes use it in the plural and talk about this, this landscape and that landscape. Um, but most often because they want to compare um, maybe very, very different um, sort of geographical phenomena from, from different parts of the world. So they might want to say, you know, this is a tundra landscape in the Arctic and this is a tropical forest landscape and very far apart, very different. And they're, they're just pluralizing it for the sake of comparison rather than supposing that the world is actually made up of, of this plurality because the, the reality, if you get onto the ground, is that, is that you, you can just keep on traveling and, and, and one thing grades into another. And it's very hard to say, um, you know, where where any boundaries are because it's, it's just a, a like like it's the same as with, with climate or meteorology. You know, they're, they're just gradients everywhere, rather than uh, rather than actual um, actual divisions. Uh, and but 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 then the other thing that there can be is is folds. Um, so when you think how can if 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 really it's just a continuum with all these gradients, then how can you get the clashes that you're talking about? And I think you can, um, if you imagine, if if you, were to, if you were to take a sheet, a continual sheet like like you have on your bed, and 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 then lift the sheet in two different places, and then lift them up, and then make these two. So you've got a fold under one hand, and another fold under the other one, and then you bring them into contact then suddenly you have one bit of sheet 
bumping up against another bit of sheet that before had been in completely different places. And you could have something like a clash. So that I think that, that when we're talking about clashes, it's actually about the way in which things get crumpled and folded. And, and again, actually, the, the Earth gives us a good example because I mean, what happens in Earth geomorphological processes, faults you know, where, where, or, or where mountain ranges are built up because tectonic plates bump into one another. It's, it's something like that. Uh, that that um, rather than rather than any kind of classificatory boundaries, it's more like um, it's more like masses of some sort or another that, that 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 then can can for whatever reason get folded up and and and, and bump into one another. And and so when we talk about how sometimes about worlds in collision, you know, and 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 and, and, and this kind of thing, I think it's that. That we're talking about but the, the thing about it is that even though you've got a clash or a collision the field in which it's taking place is still a continuous one it doesn't actually have any have any breaks in it and i think that's that's the critical thing mm -hmm. we can so we can understand clash within an ontology that is fundamentally a continuous one mm -hmm. If that makes sense. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, it it uh, it brings together some some elements that uh, I think those um, I don't know when when you have draw like circles and they intersect with each other and yeah. something like in between. But it's very flat. It's like uh, it mm. within the clash, something gets lost, something gets yeah. put together, and I think this is very. Um, the model is way too easy uh, in that. Yes. So those holes can be also. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've often thought in terms of spirals, instead of thinking of intersecting circles, as in all those diagrams, you keep seeing diagrams of intersecting circles. If one thought of each circle as a spiral, and you thought of all those spirals sort of swirling into one another, like they do in the ocean, then you'd actually have a more realistic picture. Yes, thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, uh, Tim again and Cornelia for your uh, for your question. We do have uh, a few more questions in our Q&A box. Um, mm -hmm. I think you can see the question of um, uh, I Oliver. Can, yes, I can see the question. So, um, I mean, I could read it out. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Please, if you don't mind to read it out. Or, yeah, or, I'll miss out the... So, the um, so Oliver is, is studying, doing an MA in Cultural Heritage and Museum Studies, and where the term... Oops cultural landscapes uh, crops up, referring to how culture is a process that plays out across clash, classes and borders, as well as accumulating over generations. And this concept features similar notions to knowledge scapes, such as sword fighting, smithing, craftsmanship, being termed as intangible or lived heritage found across regions. What is the distinction between cultural landscapes and knowledge scapes in this sense. So that the question here, as I understand it, is, is, is there a real difference between knowledge scapes in some sense and the way in which um, cultural heritage people uh, would talk about cultural landscapes or intangible or lived heritage? Oof, that's a big one. I mean, the the that there, as you know, as I'm sure you know, um, there are there are a lot of problems with the idea of intangible heritage and the difference between intangible and tangible heritage. Um, and I mean, the assumption is that is that knowledge is intangible; uh, you can't touch it. Whereas things like artifacts and buildings are tangible, you can touch them. So it immediately sets up this division between the abstract stuff in the head and the material stuff out in the world. Um, I would imagine that one of the key things that you would want to do with the concept of knowledge scape is to get rid of that dichotomy. Um, to say that, well, in any way, whatever knowledge scape is, it's not intangible versus tangible, or it's not, it, it transcends or obviates 
um, that particular difference. So if heritage people are still using cultural landscapes, as, I mean, I think, uh, uh, or from what I've seen, a lot of heritage people would still make a contrast between what they call the cultural landscape and what they call the natural landscape. Uh, and the, the natural landscape is, you know, the actual landscape you can see out there, and the cultural landscape is the knowledge in people's heads. And and one one is tangible, and the other is, is intangible. And what you would want to do with knowledge scape is to get beyond that. Uh, and there are all sorts of other suggestions in archaeology as to how you might do it. I mean, there's. There, there's like Colin Renfrew's material engagement theory and all that kind of thing, which builds on the these ideas about the extended mind and how people think, um, not just with what's in their heads, but with all the stuff that's around in the environment as well. I mean, I have my reservations about that that kind of theory, but it's something one might, one might perhaps bring in uh, at that point to say that um, if we're talking about a knowledge scape, we're talking about an extended mind. That um, that is not confined to brain or body, but spills out into all sorts of features of the environment, which are co-opted into processes of of human problem solving, uh, navigation, skilled practice, whatever it might be. I think that's probably the best kind of answer I can I can give to that right now. I think I think that's that's actually really really interesting, and uh, I wish we we had more time today to keep doing this actually. But Tim, if you are happy to answer one more question, mm -hmm. um, perhaps uh, Emanuele Prezioso, uh, we are um, if you wouldn't mind to unmute yourself, and you can ask maybe one last question for uh, for today. Yeah, sure. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone, that has been really great. Uh, I'm happy to hear that Tim just mentioned material engagement theory as in work with Lambrus. Uh, my question is quick, really quick. So your first two points about tradition and knowledge made me think about how fragile idea of style uh, in terms of a cognitive process writ large. And my question is, to what extent would you agree on the idea that this the process of a tradition mo continuously moving on can be seen as a memory? Ah, yeah. Thanks, thanks for that because I I meant to talk about memory and, and somehow it it slipped. I slipped off, off my piece of paper and I, I and um so that means we can we can have a word about memory that should have been should have been in there and I, I, I did mean to talk about it. Um, I usually with with Alfred Gell I, I I usually disagree with everything he ever says. I don't, I don't know what it is about Gell, but I, I somehow I think he's got everything wrong and 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 the the the, the curious thing is that in his life, he went in the opposite direction to everybody else. Um, everybody else, myself included, started off as a sort of um, closet cognitivist without really reflecting on it very much, just assuming that knowledge and being are separate and blah, 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 and we know and we do. And, and then sort of discovering phenomenology or ecological psychology or something and, and gradually working our way out of that cognitivism into something um, which, which gets gets beyond uh, those divisions. Uh, Alfred went in exactly the opposite direction. He he was reading phenomenology before the rest of us had ever heard of it. Um, uh, you know, in back in the in the 1970s, early 1980s, talking about Merleau Ponty. I never heard of this guy, and and but then he went in the opposite direction and ended up as a really hard nosed cognitivist. Um, rejecting all the wishy-washy stuff. So I ended up disagreeing with everything he's, he, he, he says, basically. But, but the thing about, um, about memory is, is, is whether we start with, um, with structures of memory, of, 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 of stored representations, or whether we start with remembering as a life process. Of going along, so that you know when when you walk along a familiar footpath, you're going along and you're moving into the future, but you're also remembering as you go. Um, there's a wonderful paper which I always go back to by a psychologist called an ecological psychologist called David Rubin. It was called "Go for the Skill," 
no, yeah, go for the skill. It was called, and and um, and and he said basically there are two ways of thinking about everything, including memory, which is what he was talking about. One is a complex structure, simple process model, and the other is a complex process, simple structure model. You could deal with everything either way, but the complex structure, simple process model is something like um, oh, if you have a uh, you have a gramophone record of a symphony, uh, an incredibly complicated thing. And that that gramophone record is full of of grooves, uh, which which are incredibly precisely cut and detailed, and the rest of it. You put it on a machine, and the machine itself is simplicity itself. It's just a vibrating needle and a and and an amplifier, and that's it. And you put the record on. And the symphony comes out. So in that case, you've got a very complex structure. That's all the grooves on the record. A very simple process, just the vibration and the amplifier. The alternative, or let's say it's a, let's say you're listening to a, to to on the on the record to a, a Bach a cello suite, right? So you've got you've got the, the the memory of this suite engraved in the record. You've got the mechanism, the record player faces off. Now, I sit down to play this same Bach suite on my cello. That's why I give this example, because that's what I do. So I'm sitting down and I'm playing the Bach suite on my cello. Um, wow, is it a complex process? I don't actually have very much by way of structure in my head. But the process of performing it in which I actually recreate the music, reproduce it, in the performance is, is you know, it, it's extraordinarily complex process. Now, says Rubin, you could imagine memory either way. Do we imagine memory as this disc where everything is pre-cut and is loaded up? Or do we imagine memory as the act of performance? And naturally, I prefer the latter, but Alfie Gell is predisposed towards the former. Yeah, that, that's good. Yeah, so. I, I think it, if it makes sense for you, it's also a way of thinking in terms of a cognitive ecology uh, in Atchin's terms, because then you have a whole system with many different things. It's not just, so you have the disc or you have the person reproducing, but the person reproducing is, I would say, reenacting to a certain mm. extent. Mm. I, I'll do recreating. I think it's better because we always do something that is different because of the dynamics of the environment where we are. So. I think it makes mm -hmm. sense. So we should think more, like, I don't know, holistically? Yes. But, but I, I'm, for some reason or other, I'm allergic to the notion of cognition. I, 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 just, um, I, I just think there's something, there's something wrong about it. <laughs> it's really just a word. And, 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 and often, you know, whenever I talk to cognitive psychologists of all sorts of persuasions, including, you know, those of those who support radically embodied cognition and, and the rest of it, there are all sorts in there. And, and whenever you produce a, a critique of cognitivism, you'll always find a cognitive scientist who says, oh, we don't do that anymore. We're, 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 we're touchy-feely these days. And yet, and yet there's still something that grates about it. Um, and I think it's just that they're still approaching action in the world as a process of problem solving, uh, so that the so that I'm cognition creating. has its task to produce a solution to the problem, which is then enacted. Yeah. And that is where I have a problem. Yeah, it's still a calculator. It's still a computer to certain Yes. Extent. Yes. It's, it might be a very ecological calculator, but it's still calculating. Yes. Yeah, I see that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Emanuele, and thanks, uh, team, as well. This was a really, really interesting discussion and wonderful, really, presentation and sessions of questions. Uh, I think we can start um, wrapping up the event. We still have several questions that we could not really address today, but we documented the questions. And if you want to follow up with more, please do get in touch with us. We'll try to mediate with Professor Tim Eagle, uh, should it time to <laughs> go through more questions afterwards. Um, but for now, I just would like to thank once again, uh, Professor Tim Ingold for the fantastic 
uh, talk and for answering all the questions. Uh, we are really, really grateful for it. And I also would like to thank all the uh, contributors and authors that have participated in, in our project um, in different uh, shape forms of descriptions. And also we are grateful to James Clark, who edited uh, the book reviews that are part of this uh, volume, including the uh, book reviewers that, of course, contributed to the volume itself. We are grateful to Matilde Ricci as well, uh, who designed our uh, beautiful cover of the, um, of the volume, and to all the members of the ARC committee at University of Cambridge for um, helping us in the process in, in many ways. And of course, thanks to all of you people that joined us today, they really uh, made a, a, a huge difference and it was massively important for uh, the three of us uh, co-editors. So just for you, a final reminder, the book is available for you to order. I've been sharing the link in the chat box uh, quite frequently in the past hour and a half, but you can all, always get in touch with us via email and we can help you. We can provide links for ordering the volume um, and, and more. So yeah, once again, thanks everyone. And thanks Professor Tim Ingle for uh, joining us today. <laughs>